10, but maybe it's five. Welcome everyone to the next session. And now we have got Tui from the University of Tromso. Um, who's going to talk to us uh, about consumer acceptance of low trophic species and consumer attitudes. So we get started now. Welcome Tui. Hello everyone. So hopefully that you have more energy after the break with case and coffee, tea. Um, before I start the presentation, maybe I would like to introduce myself for those who are online. Uh, I'm Thuy Pham from Tromsø University, um, UAT, the Arctic University of Norway. Uh, today, I'm very glad to be on behalf of the team to present uh, the work from Aquavita, that is a consumer acceptance and market potential. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the partners involved in Work Package 5, food safety, consumer acceptance, and market potentials. Hopefully that I don't miss um, someone and anyone who involved in the work package. And here are all the key contributors of um, work package five. We have three main tasks, nutrition and food safety, uh, consumer acceptance, and market potential. And here are all the five key persons uh, for uh, dedicated to the task. Unfortunately, uh, Temis and Inglin from Novima are not able to join us for the final conference. Um, so, and Edo from Tromsø University, uh, is, who is leading the task on nutrition and food safety, is not able to join us for the final conference. So therefore, uh, Bala and myself will um, present on behalf of the team and on behalf of the key persons uh, to present the work. Um, um, I will present first on consumer acceptance and Vala will be following up and present market potential. You can move now. Yes. Uh, so this is consumer acceptance. Apologies, it's not uh, sharing. It's still stuck on the on the same slide. Maybe you need to stop sharing and share again. Apologies for for the technical difficulties. consumer acceptance um, content, um, I would like to give a brief um, summary on nutritional and food safety aspect of Aquavita products. Uh, this led by Edo from Tromsø University. Um, and the result of the findings actually published today. So in Frontiers in Aquacultures, and Mikela here is also co-author of the papers. Um, you can read more uh, in the article, but uh, the summaries of the, I already list all the very brief summaries of the result. Uh, in, for macroalgae are rich um, in vitamin B12, omega-3 and 6 fatty acid, selenium, iodine, proteins, and dietary fiber. Abalone produced in IMTA um, in general has more benefits than risk. Raw from sea urchins uh, are nutritious and safe for consumption. Oysters are uh, excellent dietary resources of various health-related um, nutrition, which are available for terrestrial-based protein sources. The white finfish and tambacu and uh, piraruku 
uh, excellent nut nutritional values with potential for improvement for farm fish compared to wild fish. So here are all the species that we study in nutrition and food safety. And this species will be also the focus for consumer acceptance and market potential. Um, the problem of all the Alpha Vita products uh, is that these, these are the new products. So therefore, our role in Alpha Vita is to um, explore or to ex investigate consumer concerns in relation to these new products. We have two main objectives. The first objective is to identify um, consumer preferences, uh, particularly um, positive and negative motives, perception, and attitudes of consumers towards consumption of low traffic aquaculture products. We have conducted survey, an online survey. Uh, we used the third company to collect the data from 1,200 consumers <coughs> spread throughout four countries uh, in, around the Atlantic Oceans. This is US, South, South Africa, um, Brazil, and Spain. And uh, particularly, we focus on the coastal regions. The second objective is to uh, estimate the consumer's willingness to pay. Uh, we focus on different attributes of uh, low traffic aquaculture products. Particularly, we asking the consumers how much they are willing to pay more for if we try to add different attributes of um, low traffic aquaculture products. We targeting on different pillars of sustainability. This is a nutritional values or environmentally friendly or um, socially responsible products. For this, for the second objectives, we focus on, on the expert panel. Uh, it means that we collected the data from four, uh, 50 consumers. This is also consumers but we regard it as an expert panel because we uh, collected the data uh, through the, the tasting event in Brest, France, and also the Brazil, uh, Brazil meetings. And they are, um, they are chef, they are cooking students, and they are research scientists within uh, Aquavita Consortium. So they are very experienced with the, uh, how the, they know how to prepare the food, and how they, um, they are familiar with the products and I'm sure in some extent they already taste the products. So the difference between the two groups is for the first group, we, um, we ask the consumers uh, without uh, providing uh, specific products. So we, in some way we just provide information about a species. But for the second uh, group, expert panel, we present the products and we restrict on some of the products. What we found is quite interesting. The first words uh, comes to the first words comes to the mind comes to minds of consumers when we ask consumers uh, about these products. Uh, the first, uh, for example, for macroalgae, when we ask about uh, macroalgae, the people would think this is sushi. This is food from the sea. When we ask about oyster, they think this is delicious. This is raw food, and this is also eatable. We ask about sea urchin. They say, okay, this is from the sea. This is also eatable. but." Quite a few people said that they never tried sea urchin before. If we ask about the products, general products from low traffic uh, species products, the general impression is that this is, the general impression is positive and they think this is fish from the sea, or this is fish or this is food from the sea. And this is, of course, based on the 1,200 consumers. So come back to, to the objectives that we are looking for. 
the motives, perceptions, and attitude of consumers. Uh, regarding um, consumers' motive, the three aspects uh, regarded as the most important issues, that is sensory appeal, natural content, and health. For the perception, the, there is no major issues uh, on consumers' perception. Uh, the minor bottlenecks are pollution from waste and feed and uh, coastline uh, disruption. The people in general, they have no difference on attitude between low traffic uh, species products and conventional products. Brazilian cons consumers are already open to uh, low traffic aquaculture products, while in North America, they are more hesitant to the products. And consumers in the South Africa and, uh, and Spain are in some way in between. Here is the figure uh, illustrate uh, the, the point. We try to estimate the consumer trust in government and trust in producers. Uh, this is just one aspect we try to estimate. And if you look at the figure, you will see Brazil are extreme to the right. Why um, US are extreme to the left and South African and uh, and Spain are in some way in between. Um, so the, to summarize for this part, um, we need more communication campaigns and we and need to focus on trust. Uh, for example, uh, we should be more transparent on the, um, should be more transparent to the production system. On the consumer willingness to pay, estimate on the consumer willingness to pay, consumers willing to pay a premium for high nutritional values products. In general, the people are not interested in the products with medium nutritional value. Environmental concerns are also reflected in the willingness to pay, and social concerns are not very high on the agenda. Of course, remember that this estimate focus only on these four species. This is macroalgae, abalone, sea urchin, and oyster, because these products are present in the tasting event. Particularly for environmental friendly, we, the consumers, are willing to pay 40%. And for high nutritional values products, the people are willing to pay for 50%. More or uh, both the normal price. This is uh, the result is based on the 50 consumers of uh, the 50 expert. I have a little time. Yeah. For the exploitable result, we have three key uh, exploitable results for this. This is a guidelines on risk uh, benefit assessment. Uh, also provide information about consumers' preferences and uh, the estimate on the consumer's willingness to pay. Um, how we disseminate the, um, the exploitable result? To the wider public, legacy, policy brief, white paper, as you heard um, during the last uh, two days. Um, we also have connection to Fao Edo, my colleague. She's working in. Uh, she has been, has a, a big network with FAO. So we try to disseminate through this network. We also have publication, uh, two working papers on willingness to pay and one paper on consumer acceptance, and we also involve PhD student in future work. The take home message is age, gender, income is has an impact on the consumer choice. And so therefore, com communication campaign is needed. And the marketing strategies should be customized based on the geographical locations. The sustainability aspects should be emphasized where high nutritional values and environmentally friendly uh, products should be on the agenda. This is all for my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Tui. Now we have Valor from Mattis in Iceland, who's going to talk about market potential low trophic species. Oh, that's the same. What's the same slide? Yeah. Oh, what did you do? Why? Why? Thank you, Colin. So, like Colin said, I'm, I'm Valur uh, Norðri Gunnlaugsson from Matis, Iceland, and, and this work is also based on work from Katrin Hulta, my colleague uh, at Matis. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, so, market potential of all the good stuff we've been talking about for the last couple of days. Uh, it's interesting. Currently, that the EU is saying to us that we have to double the uh, production of proteins before 2050. So both animal and vegetable based. And that must be done without the, what we're doing currently with negative environmental impact. And uh, we have to, and the, currently the uh, Europe is, is far from being self-sufficient regarding proteins. And there are also concerns about food security and, and, and other things. So we have to move from petrol-based environment industry to bio-based somehow. And, and therefore, low traffic seems to be the obvious road in front of us. But somehow the commission is not giving us money to do Aquavita 2, yeah. like they should be. <laughs> it's a shame. Shame on them. But uh, like T was mentioning to you, uh, we have to, with the consumer study that we did in the project, uh, we have to increase kind of the transparency of the production system. How, and we've been talking to this earlier in the session, how can we educate this consumer about all the good stories that we've been heard, hearing for the last couple of days Regarding low traffic species, how can we get this message through so they really search for them or, or, or aim for them when they're choosing their uh, meal? Uh, you can see there we could talk about the most influential factors, price, obviously. Uh, everything is price sensitive these days. They're interested in the nutritional value that he was talking about. And they want to see some environmentally friendly certification, or at least we have to be able to show them that this is done in a sustainable, almost circular manner. Uh, so we looked at several species, uh, and we've been mainly looking at the EU market in this uh, research. Uh, but we're learning, we take examples from other markets because we see Low traffic, like T was saying, low traffic is sometimes better known outside Europe than inside Europe. So macroalgae, uh, Oliver showed us this morning an interesting fact that the, we're utilizing 0.004% of possible macroalgae sites uh, in the world. Uh, so the potential is massive, but the there is a, this challenge to go from feet to food. Uh, and there's, he mentioned also the political challenges, uh, something that is allowed or the limits are, are not as strict in, in some areas than in Europe. So he's able to market his product in the US and it's not possible in some cases in Europe. So we, but macroalgae is quite interesting uh, product, uh, especially for, can include vegans. So we have to go to, towards the plant-based meal uh, to combat the climate crisis and macroalgae is just perfect uh, for that. Uh, abalone, uh, I had my first abalone last year. Uh, 49-year-old, I'm not proud of it at the time. 
And that was a challenge because it was cooked Asian style, uh, cooked for five days. No, yeah, prepared for five days, cooked for one and a half. Uh, so I got this two big abalone on my plate, sitting in front of the owners of the abalone farm uh, and, and telling it how delicious they were. That was a challenge <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but, the, but then several days later, we got them in a risotto, just cooked normally, and that was delicious. So, so I, it is, <laughs> uh, like I say here, uh, it's a luxury product. It is it's a very low consumption in, in the EU market. Uh, Sylvian here is producing about 10 tons a year. The France are eating close to 50 tons, the main European market. Uh, there is a project in Iceland. Uh, they're building a vertically integrated farm for abalone, and they're going to do 1,000 tons a year. So I'm not sure how that will affect the EU market. Uh, I think the plan is not to flood it with 1,000 tons when the current market is close to 50. But it'll be interesting to see what effect it has on the market to increase the availability, at least. Uh, so it's interesting to see if that works. Uh, sea urchins, now we're threatening around land mines because Colin <laughs> no, and, and Philip, our coordinator, he is crazy about sea urchins. And the EU market is small. There's consumption in Italy, Spain, and, and no, no, France, only France. <laughs> France is massive, he says, but uh, the numbers are not big. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's coming from Iceland, of course, Ireland, Norway. So, yeah, but the main consumption is, of course, in, in Japan. And, and, the, and we can, of course, learn a bit from that market, uh, how they market it and, and how they are consumed. Uh, so oysters, uh, we had, of course, I'm only taking examples from Iceland. Uh, there was an oyster farmer in Iceland and a high-end restaurant five years ago. Uh, and then they had a Noro outbreak in the restaurant and several people got extremely sick for several days and it killed off the industry completely, both the restaurant and the farmer. And they were completely killed by COVID then in the end, but still it, it, it didn't go well. But oyster is of course the, it's, it's a Common species, uh, of course, France is, is like with the other species, France is both the largest producer and consumer. Uh, but we still have seen how, how the oyster industry is growing, like in the US, and we can learn definitely from them how they are marketing it and, and the short change they have over there. We could copy them partly. Uh, and we also looked at mussels uh, in the end, and, and, and here we finally have some proper numbers with, with production around four or 500,000 tons. Um, but the consumption has been going down. Of course, it's France again, and, and, and some of the material, uh, Spain and Italy also. Uh, but the consumption is going slowly down, and, and it's a bit of a worry uh, with the muscles. So take home message, there is this lack of knowledge regarding low trophic species and, and low trophic aquaculture. Uh, people are often not familiar with them as a food. They're unsure about the co cooking methods uh, and they're not, they're not aware of the health benefits and also the uh, sustainability of the product. So, so it's, it's, it's a challenge that we all have to work with and, and, and trying to educate and, and 
publish the, our results and, and, and trying to uh, get to the consumer with the positive message about low trophic agriculture. Uh, but the, the strange thing is, uh, it's a challenging times in the marketplace. We have the pandemic conflicts, fuel and energy crisis, but somehow that has resulted in an increase in, in seafood category as general. Uh, people are buying more seafood because they have been gaining confidence in preparing it at home. Uh, so it's so there are positive uh, results of the some of the challenges, and in general, to to put this all together, it would be good for the EU market if we were all a bit more friends in thinking <laughs> regarding consuming low trophic agriculture. Uh, th that said, maybe be more friends, but without the tantrums of being a French person. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> but, yep, that's me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Valor, for some insightful information. <laughs> You've done wonders for the low trophic agriculture world. <laughs> Where's your talk? Where's your talk? On the PowerPoint. Okay, one second. Um, one second now. Where's your talk? It's not here. It should be. It should be changed. No, no, it's not here. Just while, just while we're waiting, I just remind Valo that uh, Iceland exports 300 tonne of sea urchins into France every year, and the market is massively under-supplied. Okay, um, uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Adrianna Kochańska and I've been leading the development of the massive open online course in sustainable aquaculture for low tropic species. Um, so this is the area where we want to educate uh, the, the, the public, the future, the future experts and uh, hopefully fill some of those important uh, knowledge gaps. Um, so there was a couple of drivers uh, that motivated us uh, to do the course and um, one of them was increased interest in online um, education, especially among adults and especially during and after Corona. This has been a, a massive boom in online education and we really wanted to take advantage of that. Um, furthermore, we noticed that there was limited educational resources on low trophic aquaculture, so another important gap um, to fill. This was our opportunity to reach a wider audience uh, with free educational material, and of course it's a fantastic way to promote low trophic aquaculture and train uh, future experts. Um, so there's a couple of details about the course. Um, it's a master level course. Uh, it takes approximately 140 hours to accomplish. This is, this is equivalent to five ECT points. Um, it is fully open and free. Uh, this includes the certificate, which means um, uh, once students pass the 60% of the assessment, they can extract, uh, they can gain a certificate from the open edX platform. Um, participants can navigate the course at their own pace. This means that they can go and take any module in any order that they want. And if they don't want to, um, if they don't need the certificate, they can just do the module that they're interested in and then, yeah, leave the course. Um, so in the course, we have 11 modules. 
um, the first module introduces the aspects of low trophic aquaculture and how the energy is transferred through, uh, through the food chain. Um, we also focus on sustainability related concepts and um, how they connect to low trophic aquaculture. So a lot of the work in um, work packet seven, sustainability, it has gone into this, um, um, these modules. Um, we describe what are the various culture systems and what are the classifications. And we have a separate module which focuses on integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. And um, what's really great is that uh, we focus on a number of different species, um, mollusks, macroalgae, echinoderms, and freshwater fish. And we showcase different case studies from across the Atlantic. So um, I'm especially part, proud of this part um, because Normally, when you have educational um, courses given by European universities, they tend to be very Eurocentric. Uh, but we, we have included case studies from South Africa and Brazil, and we show the, the variation of the differences uh, across the Atlantic. Um, students learn about food safety, consumer acceptance, and product development, um, business economics, how to create business plans, and finally, they learn about governance of low trophic aquaculture and climate adaptation opportunities. Um, if you have been with us for the past uh, two days, you can see that the core structure follows a lot of what we have accomplished in this project. So this is a, a brilliant summary of the results and uh, a great dissemination of them. Okay, so we, we target our uh, course uh, primarily for undergraduate and graduate students in aquaculture or other related fields. However, this is also a great opportunity for current practitioners and policymakers to update their knowledge, especially if they're entering a new sector um, that, they have, that they're not familiar with. Um, furthermore, the course can be used by educators in the form of um, a flipped classroom and uh, used by teachers who want to uh, make use of online resources, which becomes much more popular uh, these days. And of course, because this is an open and free uh, resource, it's, it's available for everyone. And whoever is interested, you're very welcome to, to yeah, register and make use of the content. Um, so how do we, as Aquavita, use the course? Um, UIT, our university, has made the course available um, as a five ECT points. This means that you would have to register at UIT as a student. And um, in addition to the online certificate, you actually get five ECTs, which can go towards a master degree. So that's, uh, that's, that's really great. Um, and I have collected some information from some of you over the past uh, week. And I found out that uh, many of you are already using it in, in your courses in established master pro programs either to supplement or to replace some of the material. And what I found really interesting is that um, some people have reported that they use the MOOC as an introduction material for new employees and the interns. So this is, this is actually a quite exciting opportunity, uh, especially when we talk of industry partners, um, when you have pe new people coming into, into the sector. So we have done uh, a lot of dissemination uh, with the course. It is currently available uh, on a platform called MOOC.no. Uh, this is a Norwegian database for open and free courses. This means that we have quite a chance to reach um, a big audience. Um, and thankfully, we have also been um, promoted and in touch with uh, with Aquaculture Assistance Mechanism, they have posted the, the course as one of the educational resources. The European Aquaculture Society, uh, IATIP, and uh, Altanet, the, Nor the Norwegian, uh, the, the Atlantic um, Low Trophic Aquaculture Network. <laughs> so um, with these resources and also through LinkedIn, we have already reached over 10,000 people uh, advertising the course. And um, so the current status, um, I can show you what, I, I paste the certificate there just to show you what it looks like. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's my name on the certificate. I did accomplish the course, but I made a certifi certificate for myself because I can't, so why not? <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, 
um, at this moment, we have 420 enrolled students from across the globe, uh, including Vietnam, Ghana, uh, Brazil, South Africa. Um, 30 of the students have accomplished the course and have received certificates. And uh, we have currently eight students enrolled at UIT who are en route to receive uh, five ECT points for the course. And um, yeah, this, this has been a massive uh, effort and it would not have been possible without the contribution of 55 people. So um, I believe this is the task that involved the most people in the entire project. And it's been uh, an absolute pleasure with a bit of need for patience to lead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you each, uh, to each and one of you. Um, because I think we, we have achieved something amazing. And um, just um, as a final message, um, it is now in your hands. So ensure that the course lives on. Use it in your everyday uh, work, uh, disseminate it to whoever you speak to, because I think this is one of the ways where we can really make a difference to promote low traffic aquaculture. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact myself or Michaela Askan, um, who has been uh, the co-lead on, on the MOOC development. And uh, yeah, enjoy the course. And if you use that uh, QR code, you're, a bit of re you're able to register uh, straight away. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, for your information. Uh, we now have Rosa, who's going to talk about gamification. Gamification. Okay, hello again. Okay, we are going to talk about this enhancing social awareness. Um, yeah, it's mine, but no worries. No, no worries, that's good for you. Um, the social awareness on, of aquaculture through gamification. We uh, forgot to put this in the title to, to, to do the, this context because we were developing um, as a task in the project, uh, not only in this uh, knowledge transfer, engage, stakeholder engagement, but also in the in, in governance, uh, working working groups, this um, the task of uh, raising the awareness on aquaculture, which is essential and is important. We have been promoting this um, aquaculture um, in Aquavite for four years, enhancing its social reputation through uh, outreach and dissemination activities, organizing meetings, attending European Maritime Day, attending this exhibition in the European Aquaculture um, in the, uh, different, different years. And uh, the European Commission also has uh, been spending thousands of euros promoting the aquaculture. And in two seconds, these two women uh, in just one minute, with one sun and uh, one tweet, have triggered a worldwide campaign against aquaculture. So we have a lot of to do in trying to promote, continue promoting the aquaculture and telling the people, informing the people about uh, what is aqua aquaculture in a transparent way, the sustainable uh, characteristics that the aquaculture have. And the good things and the positive things that the aquaculture have, especially to the young generations and uh, to the consumers. Because if not, we are in a really uh, problem. 
talking about the aquaculture. So um, we uh, have been working on this uh, raising the awareness with um, a, um, the knowledge and information coming from, from you, from the experts in different um, topics on aquaculture, trying to produce this uh, game uh, which uh, we try to enhance this social reputation uh, playing with uh, uh, young students, young people, and, and working on learning on different aspects like the environment, the, the policies, and the governance or the spatial planning, etc., in a funny way. So um, this, uh, the, um, the target audience we decide together with the DigiMari and with the Covite Consortium is uh, the high-level students um, enrolled in the degree of master studies like marine science, oceanography, aquaculture, and biology, and combines this double phil philosophy like a um, serious game, but also using these game storming techniques. It's like using a dynamic, it's very similar to the trivial. Tri trivial. And we completed uh, 500 cards with uh, different questions, challenges, debates, and surprises, like Melissa uh, introduced uh, this morning in, in the stakeholder event. Um, the process was uh, long because we need to um, consult uh, stakeholders according to, to what we uh, proposed in the, in the proposal at the beginning of the project. So we launched a survey and we consult with a lot of uh, um, experts in Aquavitae Consortium. And also we test the, this game uh, with, with the, the first uh, pilots with uh, thanks to the CSIC, to Anton uh, and, and his students in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a ship. And also in, at Setmar with people from, the, from uh, master students in aquaculture and master students in sustainable development management. And the, this was a, a long process, as we said, you can see um, the long process or different uh, um, images or uh, board uh, creation to reach the final uh, board. You can consult here. Uh, sorry for the people online, but we have uh, here um, a game to, to see and to touch it. And these are the and examples of the questions that also we can, uh, have the opportunity to test this morning during the stakeholder event. And um, that's it. This, is, uh, this was launched in, in Brazil, in Florianapolis, so it's a very nice place for launch uh, again. And it was also testing the final test by uh, Brazilian students. So thank to our uh, Brazilian partners for uh, promoting this also. And finally, the exploitable results uh, linked to this uh, game because it's a result, it's a tangible result. And we are now uh, uh, analyzing and trying to study the different IPR protections. Um, for instance, we are uh, considering the copyright, um, to put in the copyright to this uh, game. Mm, we are also studying the possibility to print a game for the partner that requested uh, 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 again for us, for you. And also, we have established an agreement with the Fundación Biodiversidad and, uh, from the Environment Ministry in Spain. And they wanted to print 50 games or more, and translate into Spanish, and to uh, give to different education institutions. So we are now uh, doing this uh, task, but we need to put the copyright before. And also, we are having um, uh, an event, the 15th of November in Vigo, uh, playing the game again, uh, again with the people who first test the, the, the game, and also celebrating the European Maritime Day in, our con in your country, so supported by the European Commission, and also celebrating the uh, Aquaculture Day, Dia de la Aquicultura, that we have in Spain uh, during the month of November. So we joined together the Ministry of the Environmental, uh, European Commission, SEDMAR, and Aquavite, because it's an Aquavite result. Um, playing this game and uh, raising again the, the awareness on, of on aquaculture. So it was uh, also interested, the Digimari was also interested and they tried to, to test uh, the game. Probably we uh, can send in January, in the meeting in January, we can send an, uh, um, a game. 
And also we are exploring the possibility to adapt the Aquavita game to other audiences, for instance, prim primary schools, as was requested by this uh, Spanish foundation. And that's it, but the final, uh, I would like to thank to Melissa and Yolanda. The, she was uh, I'm here, sorry for the online people attending, but the, these uh, ladies were the people working very hard on this game, so thank you. And thank you very much to you also for contributing to the, to the game. And the take home messages, it's, the, it's um, a game for fun and informative. We, we can combine this entertainment with the education. Uh, this has a global perspective because it the, highlights the global significance of aquaculture, and environmental stewardship, and young engagement, of course. And it has a measurable impact because we can monitor player engagement and knowledge retention allows for the assessment of the game effecting, effectiveness in increasing the awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosa. Next now we have one of our student exchangees. We have Maylene. Maylene. What? Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Manny Schlund and I did a student exchange um, within the Aquavitae project and we got asked if we could shortly present our work, our, our exchange, what we have done. And yeah, so I, I did um, a four weeks exchange to Fiskaling in Faroe Islands um, where in August 2021, where I tried, or I worked on my bachelor's thesis uh, with a topic on a comparison of the growth of Saccharina latissima, so a sugar kelp, um, growing in an IMTA site in comparison to a natural site, so a reference site. And I just want to show shortly what the outcome was. Um, besides of the thesis itself, uh, it was a good opportunity to um, have the evaluation and the provision of the data of the one growth season of the Saccharina latissima. And the findings for, were that uh, generally there were no growth difference or there were no environmental differences for the ideal growth for Saccharina. But we ex, um, found growth difference in the end of the season. Um, this was due to the sea snail Lacuna vinta, who almost consumed the whole uh, algae on the, on the row. As you can see in the pictures, the differences are huge. Um, and it would be, would be really interesting to see where this, uh, where the origin may be has coming from. Um, yeah, that's true there. So right now, or since then, I, I've been working at the Alfred Wigan Institute, um, and I'm still involved in the Aquavitae project as a student assistant. And I'm currently doing my master's degree in Brunswick in environmental science and hopefully graduating next year. And yeah, within the project um, of Aquavite, I had also the wonderful opportunity to attend the Galway Statement event in July this year uh, as an early career ocean professional and ECOP. And um, the, the hybrid event was, uh, was celebrated a decade of um, the collaboration in marine research across the Atlantic. And it was based on the Galway Agreement. Uh, to join forces and um, in the Atlantic Ocean research, and many projects showcased their uh, and reflected their achievements within uh, the event, also the Aquavite project. But they were also focusing on interdisciplinary and intergenerational discussions and multiple ECOPs working groups, um, where yeah, showcased recommendations and had really 
uh, really good brainstorming sessions and showed um, yeah, the recommendation to the policymakers. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, this event was a great opportunity for young scientists to get involved um, and show ideas and vision of research in general. And yeah, thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> That's from my side, I guess. Really, we love Stefan. So sorry for the people in this room, but I will repeat most of the presentation from this morning for the people for online. So my name is Stef Klaasens. I'm from the Netherlands. At the moment, I'm working for Zone College, and I did my master's at the University of Algarve. And for my master's, I was involved at the student exchange program from Acavite, uh, where I did my experiment at the Federal University of Santa Catarina at the, the Marine Shrimp Lab. Uh, my supervisor was Felipe Verreira, and the supervisor from the University of Algarve was Claudia Aragon. So I went from the south of Portugal to the south of Brazil uh, from October 2021 till March 2022. And the aim of this project was to investigate if muscle meal can be used as an additive in shrimp feed and to see if it have benefits for growth or uh, cold shock resistance. Uh, like one and a half month ago, uh, we published our um, yeah, our data, our research. Uh, we had really nice results. Um, so first of all, yeah, we can use muscle meal uh, in shrimp di in shrimp diets. Um, uh, the results were like we added small amounts, like one, two, three, or four percent of muscle meal in the diet, and the control was also without. And we figured out that the one and the two percent muscle meal diets, the shrimps, they were uh, growing better than the control and the three and the four percent. And then the shrimps that were fed with the two percent muscle meal diets had even uh, ten percent more uh, weight gain after eight weeks uh, than the control. So at the moment, I'm now working at uh, Zone College as an agriculture teacher. Uh, Zone College. It's like a vocational education and training school. So like a vet school. So it's like a two levels below bachelor. So like 60% of their courses is like practical work. So uh, for example, in my case, in my course, they learn how to breed carp or catfish. And besides this, I'm also now um, uh, trying to develop together with uh, two other uh, universities, oh, yeah, like schools, Van Larenstein and ROC Free Support. They tried to develop an uh, uh, associate degree in aquaculture and fisheries. And I don't know if you have this also in the rest of Europe, but in the Netherlands, we are now having associate degree as le level five. So you have bachelor level is level six. And then you have like one level below uh, is level five. And these students are like, they have this hands-on mentality, but still uh, trained to have the overview. So we can think about the uh, hatchery manager uh, assistant, for example. And we are thinking to, we are ex expect to start uh, in September 2025. And uh, maybe it's also interesting for the stakeholders or like companies, if you really like to have like uh, students, like interns, that has the, that for example, wants to work in the production. Um, yeah, we can maybe have a student exchange for, uh, yeah, universities or companies that want this. That was my presentation already. Thank you. Thank you, 
you, Stefan. Um, we'll now have our next speaker. We're going to have Un Un from the Faroe Islands is going to present value chain analysis and business plans from the Aquavita project for low trophic aquaculture species. We start with the conclusion. <laughs> Sorry. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. My name is Un Laksa, as Colin just said. I work uh, at Shokom in the Faroe Islands, and we specialize in social economics and governance of fisheries and aquaculture. In Aquavita, we've been analyzing together with our collaborators the kind of commercial aspects, so the business aspects of these uh, innovations that we've been working on, and uh, obviously also the business plans, which is the main focus of this presentation. Uh, so if we think about what we have done during Aquavita, we've done, you've heard already during these two past days, a lot about the innovations that have been taking place and how they are affecting uh, companies and uh, the prospects for low trophic aquaculture. So in, in our work, we've been looking at first uh, value chain analysis, but then we've also been looking at profitability, socioeconomics, so how this kind of low trophic aquaculture and the upscaling will impact on, on society and job creation and so forth. And then we've also looked at making a sort of a first attempt of actually evaluating, so assigning a value to the, to the ecosystem services that, that low trophic aquaculture is providing. And then finally, we have kind of put all this together into business plans. Uh, I'm going to be talking mainly about business plans uh, in this presentation, but I want to just to highlight that there, is, there are reports on all of these topics available to, to read, and people are welcome to contact us if they're interested to hear more about them. So when it comes to the business plans, a business plan typically is something that a company is doing on their own. So it's a strategic document that the company, and typically an internal one or one that they might de develop with their investors and so forth. But in this case, that is not so relevant. So, so what we have done is, is we've tried to do a general business plan, so kind of a more sector-specific business plan. And we focused on uh, five species. So macroalgae, abalone, sea urchins, blue mussels, and tambaqui. And this represents production from, uh, from Brazil, South Africa, and Europe. Uh, so, so we've kind of been taken, what we have done is basically taken the examples of the innovations and the things that have been happening in different case studies and try to learn from that and kind of think about the sector as a whole. So we have examples uh, related to the companies that are already participating in Aquavita. But we've kind of, so it's sort of just like this meeting is sort of a hybrid business plan. So it's, it has examples, specific examples from different loca from specific locations. Uh, and then we use that and kind of try to think on a wider, a higher scale. And what's also important is that we, we've been taking kind of drawing results from across the project. So the business plans contain like results from, from the sustainability assessment, from the market uh, potential and so forth, and also the governance analysis and so forth. So you can see them as a sort of a synthesis of the project. And to do that, to kind of put it in a structure, we have used something that's called the Sustainable Business Model Canvas, and that is kind of an approach to, well, a strategic management template, you could say. It's, it's about 20 years old, but recently, sustainable has been added to the Business Model Canvas. So there, where you add, you add sort of the, the impact, uh, what you would normally in economics call externalities, both positive and negative, so the negative and positive uh, impact on society and, and environment and so forth related to the business. And then we have also added another aspect, considering the, the novelty of these kind of industries. Uh, they are kind of young industries, uh, so we've also highlighted or added to this approach uh, bottlenecks and, and kind of poten uh, potential for improvement. So the business model plan, just briefly, I'll just explain you just what that contains. So it's, it's sort of like a painting, a canvas and where you start with the value proposition. So you look at what are we develop, developing for the cost, customers, what are they kind of, what problems is, is this product or company solving? And then you go and look at the customer relationship. So there you relate to 
what type of customers are we talking to, which channels, how do we reach them, and also who do we create value for. Then when you have done that part, you move on to your activities and your resources to achieve those. So what are our core activities? What do we have to do uh, to, to develop our product? Uh, what resources do we need? And they can be human resources. They can be licenses in low trophic agriculture. That's very relevant. And they can obviously also be financial. So obviously investment, money, and so forth. And then you talk also about key partners. And this was also one argument for using this, is that when we are talking in the context of Aquavita, we think it's very important to, to consider the, the collaboration between the different partners to reach the objectives. So we look at that can also be you know, collaborators, they can be customers, uh, that can be technology providers, and so forth. Then you look also at the costs and revenue. So this is the money part of it. So you look at what are the core kind of structural costs that you have and what are your revenue streams. And then we add the costs and benefits in terms of eco-social costs and benefits. So what are our positive impacts and what are our uh, negative impacts? And then finally, we have then added also what are the bottlenecks for upscaling this sort of uh, industry and what are the areas of improvement that we need to focus on. So I'm going to go through uh, Due to time constraints, I've decided to focus on one case study. And since I'm from the Faroe Islands, I picked and been working a lot with macroalgae. Uh, I thought it would be worth to look at the one for macroalgae cultivation in the Faroe Islands, just to show you an example. So well, if we start again, like I mentioned, with the value proposition, we have a few words that kind of define this, uh, this uh, product, company. So it's words like sustainable, carbon reduction, short and reliable supply chain, high quality is also something, and functional and nutritional ingredients. And this is something you can find also with the kind of vision and, and the identity of the company that we are talking about. And then we look at the, at the customer relationships. So they are mainly, they are only selling business to business and collaborating a lot. So they're also kind of providing biomass through research collaborations like in Aquavita or other products. And then what are type of customer segments? And, and obviously, this, this was a, quite a challenge for us to do because, again, this is not about ocean rainforest, who is the subject of this. But so we try to think of it on, on a higher level, but at the same time using the example. So, so obviously, in the text that comes with it, we kind of describe that better. And then we go with the activities. What is, it, what is required to develop this product? And obviously, we have seeding and breeding. We have the nursery. You have deployment of the lines or the cultivation rig. You have farming, you have harvesting, and then you have biomass processing. Uh, the key resources that they have is uh, obviously an operational site, a license. You have a lot of human resources that are capabilities that they have developed through know-how over many years, and obviously the financial capacity to deploy and, and, and keep the operation running. One of the things was mentioned this morning was um, which Ola mentioned from Ocean Rainforest is, is the key role of, of the customers in upscaling low trophic aquaculture. So this idea that this is very critical for them, for instance, to do offtake agreements. So because as we are upscaling, we have to decide obviously on a price and how you know make a, a, an agreement on how we can how we can do this as this industry is developing, of course. Uh, then you also have research institutions as, as a very important partners. You also have the downstream industry. Technology providers are also important. We've decided to add them in this case because the technology providers have actually been in-house. There is no such solution as a good harvesting technology, or we have to actually develop it from, from scratch. So it's not a product that you can get off the shelf at the moment because we have a new industry. Uh, so then the cost structure and revenue, it's very generally presented here. Obviously, they have just been described, but, but we present the results in the deliverable again. Uh, you have obviously the main, the main operating costs are harvesting and maintenance and pro processing. Uh, and the revenue streams are currently macroalgae sales, but, but potentially we also see a potential for nutrient trading schemes and so forth in the future. So, and that's all also been discussed today. In terms of eco-social costs and benefits, there are some that are uh, generally in the literature identified. For instance, there could be shading effects uh, on the ecosystem. Uh, there could be, obviously, you utilize marine space, so there could be competition for space. You might displace some other activity in, in terms of the planning. There's the social ex acceptance topic, which is very important in, um, in the European context. In, in the Faroe Islands, I think we, we can say that there's quite a high social acceptance for aquaculture, and that has probably favored the development of, of ocean rainforest in the Faroe Islands. 
And then obviously there could, in other areas, you could have loss of recreational space as well, if you have a lot of different activities happening on the coastline. Uh, in terms of the benefits, we've also heard a lot about what sort of ecosystem services uh, macroalgae cultivation provides. So you have the bioremediation, you could have, you have a temporary uh, carbon storage, um, you have the diversification of aquaculture, the fairies economy has a very, very strong salmon aquaculture sector. Uh, and, and there has been discussed a lot the need to diversify the sector. Uh, and then obviously you have job creation in, in rural areas. In terms of bottlenecks for macroalgae cultivation, uh, there is, or areas for improvement, you could also call it. The selective breeding is a, is a, is, is a core kind of uh, challenge, you could say. We need to kind of improve the yield and composition of the macroalgae if we want to kind of extract the desired compounds from it. Uh, we need to mechanize, so technological development, we need to mechanize seeding, harvesting, and also ensure good storage stabilization. Uh, obviously, allocation of licenses is also a, a critical uh, topic. And then we also have heard today about the need to differentiate between uh, low trophic aquaculture and conventional or, or, or um, high trophic aquaculture, because you have different challenges, and, and, and typically the, the regulatory framework has them been developed for for higher trophic uh, aquaculture. And then we have also heard about the food safety, so the standards, the food standards as well, especially relating to, uh, to uh, uh, arsenic, inorganic and inorganic arsenic, and iodine content and so forth. So this is kind of very quickly the, the picture of macroalgae cultivation in the Faroe Islands. And, but then I would like to just, to just kind of complete with the leave it from the macroalgae and, and talk generally, so all the conclusions kind of draw everything together from the different species that we've been looking at. And we have, we, we highlighted six topics that, that need to be obviously addressed with kind of actions to address those. So we have biological efficiency obviously relating to, to growth and yield and so forth, operational efficiency relating to technological development, also obviously to prices, so how will you how much, you know, how much is the demand so that you can get a decent price for your product. Logistical efficiency is also relevant uh, and, and the storage stabilization. And as you can see, I didn't mention, but the icons, uh, I've put the icons so you can see where those challenges for which of the species uh, they kind of apply. And, and allocation of license is also a very, very important topic. And regulation of standards and public and consumer perception. So, so considering all these kind of potential areas for improvement, how do we then move from here? Which direction should we take? So we are trying to draw everything together from all the five different uh, business plans that we have developed. And uh, does that mean something? Two minutes, okay. Yeah, so the operational efficiency, we have, uh, we have obviously highlighted that we need to develop mechanized seating, harvesting and catch technologies. And this is relevant for sea urchins and macroalgae and also blue mussels. We need to work all the time with increasing the demand for these products and developing the markets. We know this is a novel sector and we need to think about product applications because there's lots of potential, but there's not, uh, we need to develop to make sure that actually the co customers are able to take our products. And if you can see, I'm not gonna have time to explain to you, but there's icons to suggest who, who can do something about this. So the biological efficiency, again, there we need to think about breeding and, and uh, to optimize growth, uh, yield and so forth. And we also have to develop optimized feed so that we can improve growth and feed conversion. Logistical efficiency is also, uh, and protocol quality, that's also a very relevant topic in terms of, um, uh, there's a specific one for Tampaki, for instance, that, that many of the processes are unable to, to comply with the environment, re environmental regulations. So we need to kind of ensure that, to, to support that development. Uh, we also have to improve storage stabilization and we also have to develop, for sea urchins, it's very relevant or critical to develop better logistics for the distribution of live sea urchin so that we ensure the optimal quality. And then we have a few recommendations which relate to uh, generally the growth soil. So we need to adapt, obviously, aquaculture regulations to consider the specificities of low drug aquaculture. We need to ensure more funding of research and innovation because there's still plenty of, of uh, challenges to overcome how to develop better spatial planning um, and uh, adapting and developing uh, carbon and nutrient trading schemes. And the licensing products obviously need to be more efficient. 
And then it's relating to the food standards that I already mentioned. And then the work here that also was mentioned earlier today about the consumer acceptance and, and knowledge about these novel products that people might not have tradition to eat. How can we ensure that, that they know the benefits of these, uh, both nutritionally, but also in terms of ecosystem services and so forth. Uh, finally, I would like to thank for the, uh, everyone for the collaborations. We've been collaborating in particularly with Nofema and Brahp and the University of Tromsø for, uh, for these kind of deliverables. But it, in particular, I would like to highlight the collaboration with the actual industry partners in the project who have taken the time and given us a lot of good data so that we were able to do all these analysis. It's been really, really um, interesting uh, experience and we have learned a lot from the process and hope to continue the collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So next up on the list, we have Richard and we have Dirk. So Richard and Dirk are both from South Africa and they're going to be talking to us about uh, economic viability. <clears throat> You don't have a presentation. Okay, that's fine. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Clark. I'm the managing director of Wild Coast Avalon, Avalon Farm based in South Africa. Um, going on what Valo said a little bit earlier in this presentation, I'm about ready to uh, give 300 people their notice and say to them that uh, there's no chance, there's no, there's no hope for, for, for Avalon. Um, but then I remembered there's about 1.6 billion people in China that has a different opinion, so <laughs> we're still good. Um, uh, talking about the economic impact and actually how um, Aquavite has helped us as a company, I'm gonna take us from the, the micro to the macro impacts. Um, on a micro level, the research that was done through the Aquavite program has caused us to pivot uh, away from inorganic fertilizers to organic fertilizers. Um, it has increased our output from seaweeds and it has saved us, well, exactly half our costs. Uh, for a company, you know, it's not a huge proportion of our costs, but I mean, it's well, it's 850,000 Rand a year. Um, so that's a direct saving for the company that we can attribute directly to the research that was done via uh, Aquavite. Moving on from that, one of the aims that we've also tried to do is look at other species that we can incorporate into our system. Um, that was valuable research that was done. Unfortunately, the species that was selected turned out not to be really viable in our market. And uh, we can't really you know, use that in, in an economic sense. However, the research has shown that there are ecosystem profits at a, in a tank level, where co using the, the sea cucumbers in the, with the abalone, in the abalone tanks could actually have a saving, increased growth in abalone and um, a better, uh, less um, 
uh, negative out, you know, outputs out of the tanks. So there's a definite potential. I think it has shown that uh, we are on the right track. It's just now the search is on to find the right species so that we do can make it, uh, you know, turn it into economical uh, product. That is another product delivered from from the farm. Um, the biggest, in my view, the biggest contribution that we've learned from the work that was done, the research that was done at Aquavite, was to very clearly illustrate to us as a company that guys you need to do something about the energy. Uh, we pump six and a half million liters of water every hour. That requires a huge amount of energy. And uh, South African energy is mostly, mostly uh, coal-based, so in terms of carbon impacts, that's a huge, huge impact. So what this research has done is it has quantified to us the, the, the size of the problem, and it has allowed us to um, really go out there and see, okay, how are we going to change that? So we've already pivoted away. Um, we are currently, as a company, we're in the process of uh, going towards green energy. Hopefully by next year, end of next year, we as a company would be 100% uh, powered by green energy. And I think that by itself will make a big, big difference in, in our sustainability over the long term. Um, what we've also have learned and, and, and what is useful to us as a company is the, the fact that we can use a lot of this information, this, all the work that, that ASA has done in terms of helping us along the path to attain best aquaculture practices, practices certification. Um, this is something that is required in our markets now. It's becoming more and more of a thing. We've embraced this and we believe that it's going to give us an edge in the market going forward because of the fact that we are, will, will be able to offer this to our customers and say, listen, we are best aquaculture practices certified. We will be the first uh, abalone farm in South Africa that will be certified as such. Uh, some of the other abalone farms I know have moved on, but they've used different uh, pathways. But we are moving towards that. Uh, in, in Because I think at the end of this, I mean, the question have come up, how do we change? Well, we have to change the consumer perceptions. And we have to increase the value placed on sustainability. Um, overall, I believe it's the work uh, a lot of the work that was done through Aquavite has um, changed our company to change direction or, or, or motivated us to change direction. And I think that uh, it would not be a stretch to say that uh, this work or this co collaboration um, has definitely uh, put us on a path to a much more sustainable future. And it has shown that sustainability at a company level can also be good for, for, for people and for the earth. So I think um, if we take that into consideration, I would like to thank Aquavite, everybody here for the opportunity to work together, for the funding that we've received in doing all of this research, and I think uh, we are certainly very grateful for, for all the assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so, um, Dirk from, from Marifeed, as I said earlier. So, looking at a customer like this that I need to supply, um, and it's got this focus on thinking about uh, research and about sustainability, for us back, the value chain lies within finding a solution and a product that we can include uh, this research, that we can include us. But at the end of the, the day, I need to supply him a product that has growth. It doesn't help. We, we have a value chain. We have a great product. Um, and it sounds sexy that I include um, seaweeds in there or, or a low trophic species. But at the end of the day, I come to the customer and says, it's costing him 
so much more, 10% more, um, but the value for him lies within growth um, and the definition of, of, the, of the product at the end of the day. So that is why these research is, is important for us, understanding where we're going with that, understanding what is the end result with that, but making sure there's a solution for the future. Um, it is also for us important at the end of the day to find the solution in responsibility. Where do we procure? How do we procure? How do we find these markets um, is, is for us very important. And then uh, value in, in where we're going with our certifications. We started up uh, with a normal ISO system, changing that in a global gap certification um, that uh, led from, from the Aquavitae project. Um, and it's moving now further into a ASC certification that's, that's uh, moving forward. Um, and that's just showing the responsibility one have to take to get this value chain full out from end to end, making sure you can give the right promise to the customer at the end of the day in a value chain. So that's short and sweet um, in time as you requested, but um, also thank you for, for, for the great leadership um, for this project and we're looking forward to a, a great future with, with EU. Equivitate you. Thanks, guys. Well done. And to our final presentation of today, we have Eva from Biolan who's going to talk to us about her work. Now, presentation is one. This one. So, good afternoon, everybody. So I hope you saved just a little bit of energy for this last talk today. Um, my name is Eva González. I work for Biolan, which is a medium-sized company in the north of Spain, specifically in Bilbao. And today I'm going to present you uh, the BioFIS 7000, which is a connected and portable sulfide measuring device for aquaculture applications that we developed within the Aquavitae project. So just to give you a little bit of context on what uh, Bioland does, uh, Bioland offers analytical tools for the agri-food sector. So the food industry requires analytical tools for self-monitoring and be sure that they, com they are compliant with food safety and quality regulations. So for that, we developed, manufacture and market. We do everything in-house, uh, enzymatic biosensors, immunograph immunochromatographic tests and molecular diagnostics. Our tools, our analytical tools are fast, simple, accurate and reliable, economical. And also recently we've worked in digitalization and connection and also on sustainability. Uh, our main sectors are the fish and the seafood industries. Uh, so for that we commercialize uh, histamine and a sulfate biosensors. So histamine is a biomarker for freshness of pelagic fish. And then for sulfide, we, we, I will tell you a little bit more uh, later. But we also work in other sectors. So we have uh, lactose and glucose sensors for milk applications or dairy products applications, and also organic acid sugars for wine. Uh, and also we applied the sulfate uh, biosensors for other type of foods uh, apart from uh, seafood. So our technology is certified, so we usually certify our, certify our biosensors uh, with the AOIC and I'm happy to share with you that recently we just got the certification of an official method of analysis of our sulfate biosensor, not the one I'm presenting today, developed uh, within Aquavitae, by, but another one, which is a desktop one, and it's used for uh, measuring sulfide in shrimp meat. So uh, the, what we have done, we developed a portable connected device for sulfate monitoring in shrimp aquaculture, but just for culture water, not for the, for the meat. So shrimp aquaculture industry employs sulfide as an additive to prevent melanosis, so that's, that's the darkened darkener of, uh, of, the, of the heads 
when, when we harvest shrimps. And uh, the sulfate levels in shrimp, meat, in shrimp meat are regulated. And control of the sulfate levels of the culture water contributes to a better control of the sulfate in the meat. So there are different, uh, our customers uses, use the, our sensors for culture water in different ways. So there are uh, companies that they reuse the water that they have in the beans for harvesting the shrimps. So maybe for the second time, they have to check the sulfate levels to see how much they have to add up and top up the sulfate. So that's our one uh, way of using our sensor. Other way, other companies, they don't reuse the water, but they have like really, so they have optimized the concentration of sulfate really in a really, really narrow range. So they are 100% sure that the meat won't, uh, won't have more of the regulated um, concentrations of sulfate. So basically, Aquavitae has fostered the transition from the Bio 700 to the Bio 7000. So for doing that transition, we have uh, done some eco design, digitalization, and validation. Uh, within the eco design and digitalization, so we've worked in different parts, but mainly we have gone we have gone from using. Uh, analog electronics to using system on chip components. So those are more cheap. They are also, we use less uh, components and allow, allowed us to digitalize the, some of the parameters that we are interested in, in, in monitoring for the measurements. Um, the Bio 7000 is operated by an app and also is uh, and it's connected through Bluetooth. Uh, the, the equipment can, um, can be used without the app and without the platform, so it's a standalone um, measurement device. But also if you connect it to the app, then you can launch your data to the, to the platform. That way you, you, you have completely traceability of your, of your results when you are on site, which is a really important, important thing because it kind of merges together what it has what it, it has the you know the big labs where traceability is always per, is always uh, uh, performed and it's always met, but not maybe when you go to the on site and you have all your things around and you maybe lose a paper and you know so that combines both things. Um, we have also worked in the eco design of the consumables, so we have uh, we work the. Bio 700 used these two electrodes that you see there in red, and we used to put them in um, with a plastic um, kind of frame. So we, we have uh, decreased the amount of plastic, we have decreased, we have put the two electrodes in just a single device, we have also decreased the, the um, volume that we need for the samples from like 200 microliters to 40 microliters. And we uh, overall we have improved sustainability along the whole product life cycle, especially, especially in the manufacturing uh, bit. Uh, we've validated our uh, biosensors for two analytical ranges. Uh, we've uh, performed stability <laughs> tests, and we've developed also a tool for device control. So this uh, equipment is used. Uh, in different harsh environments. So maybe lots of soil concentration, uh, lots of humidity, and the equipment can get damaged. So we have this tool that allows us when a customer doesn't know, oh, my measurement is not working, with this tool we can tell them, okay, your equipment is working, so we have to look for something else. The problem is somewhere else, okay? Um, we've validated it uh, on field within the Aquavitae project, so with some of our uh, customers that they had the previous Bio 700, so they we gave them the new device. They did uh, on-field validation. Uh, they, we, did, we performed with them some training. Then we went to the beans when, where they do the harvesting, and we took some sulfate measurements with them. And then we got some feedback uh, and some corrective actions were also planned. So uh, exploitable results, I think it's quite clear that we have developed portable sulfate measurement device with uh, IoT capabilities. We, ca we can measure sulfate in less than a minute. Uh, we have two analytical ranges. We have an app and we have a platform for data analysis and storage. 
And the take home message, uh, again, a little bit of, I'm repeating a little bit myself here, but we have a measuring device for, that meets the requirements, the requirements of the shrimp production industry. And we continue, I mean, we have developed this, this, this biosensor, but we continue to improve, uh, improving our platform. So we, we continue to make, to, we, we like to speak with customers and see what they need to get uploaded uh, there. So, and we work with them a lot. And we, we plan on commercializing it through the BioLine commercial channels. And yes, I mean, it's been a pleasure to work with you in Aquavita. And if you ever need some biosensors to be developed, remember us and we're here for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Okay, so that's the end of the program today. I want to thank you for your patience and just give me a very short, we're over time I realise, so one minute perhaps to just very briefly sum up. I don't think we have time for questions and uh, discussion unfortunately. Um, as with all uh, Aquavitae meetings, at the end of them, I'm amazed at the width and the breadth of research and innovation that's gone on within them. I think we can all be very proud of the research that we've done over the last four and a half, and innovation that we've done over the last four and a half years, and the implementation of that with the help of industry partners. Um, and on that note, I think we should also be aware of how lucky we are within the Aquavitae Consortium of both the research partners we have, uh, the industry partners we have in terms of the cultural mix, uh, the national mix, the mix of species, uh, the enthusiasm and uh, that they've approached the project with. So thank you to all of you. Uh, also the EAG, of course, we have our, our young uh, career professionals. So we've been very, very fortunate in Aquavitae. If you want more information, please don't hesitate to contact us. We have our website, we have all the QR codes. Um, this uh, two days afternoon sessions will be f put online as short uh, film clips. So I guess in summary, I, I think it's obvious that we can't solve all the societal issues that we're facing within the world, but I think it's also quite clear that low trophic, and I think everybody in this room would agree that low trophic aquaculture can contribute to sustainable feed, sustainable food, uh, and sustainable ingredients uh, for feed. But it's our job, I think, and the challenge perhaps is to take it beyond this room. And I like, I like the, the term that you used, Adriana, you used to ensure that the muck lives on. I would ask you to ensure that the project lives on. Aquavitae too, let's see about that. It may not be with me, but... Uh, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for your patience over yesterday and today and, uh, and thanks once again. <laughs>